not met, my name is Eric, and it truly is my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. I would encourage you, if you're new, to come on up and say hello. It would be great to meet you and your family and welcome you here to Journey Church. And before you go, be sure to stop by our Next Step station. We have a free gift that we'd love to give to you as our way of saying thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. And uh, we're just so glad that you're here. We want you here, and I hope you feel welcome this morning. So we've been in this series called Epic for the course of this year. I hope you've been enjoying it. We recently made a transition from the Old Testament to the New. As you look at the Old Testament, it was filled with all these different prophecies, all of them pointing primarily to Jesus. Some of them had to do with other things like the day and age in which we live in. One of the most powerful ones that we read was found in the book of Isaiah that prophesied none other than the fact that one day Jesus would come, which we know he did some 2,000 years ago, that he would die a sinner's death on the cross, that he would rise again for the salvation of all mankind. And man, one of the things that I enjoy that really builds my faith is that when I read those Old Testament prophecies and I see them come true, I'm like, yes. And then I look at our own generation and I hear about the prophecies about the day and age in which we live in, where it says things like information will increase, that there'll be a day and age where there'll be these two witnesses in Jerusalem who are prophesying about the end of the age, and you'll be able to see them from anywhere on the planet, or the day and age with some of these darker prophecies about the fact that there may be a day when we will not be able to buy or sell without a particular mark to be on us, right? And then it says when these things all start to come to pass, that Jesus is going to return soon and very soon. So you look at those things like the prophecy about the reformation of Israel coming back and becoming a nation again. We do live in an age that's defined as the information age, do we not, right? We live in an age where you can pull out your phone and you can see video from anywhere, anytime on the planet. We live in a day and age where how, how many of you got cash in your pockets? Any, if you got cash in your pocket, pull it out, wave it around. Can I, can I have it? I'm, I'm teasing. But most of us don't have cash in our pockets anymore. We live in a day and age where we use debit cards and other things of that nature. So you can envision that it would probably be pretty simple to just shut Visa off, right? We live in the day and age that the Bible's talking about, and today we're going to see some fulfillment of prophecies. We're going to talk about some future prophecies that are yet to come that I hope motivate us to live a lot like the guy that we're going to be talking about today because I believe his message is the same message that God calls us to today. So why don't we go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into God's Word in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I'll keep our message a little bit briefer today because I want to give you a chance to get back there and meet those group leaders. So, Father, I come before you this morning, and my heart is full of the time that we've already had and worshiping you in song. Lord, I just love you, and I pray that I do a great job of communicating what you would have me communicate to the people who are here this morning. I ask that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear the words that you want them to apply in their life today, would you give them the power to do that? Would they hear what you're saying to them? Would it inspire them? Would it give them hope? Would it challenge them today to apply the things that they're learning and they would see the miraculous results that happen as a result of you being at work in their lives? So, Lord, use the words of Mark to touch our hearts, to change us, to transform us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it starts with a very seemingly simple sentence on the surface. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It tells us what this book is going to be all about. It tells us really what the whole Bible is all about. It tells us what all the prophets were talking about. It tells us what our lives should be about. See, we were created to be second and not first. Our lives were created to point others to Jesus, to share the good news of the gospel. That's what you were created for. Do you realize that? Once you surrendered your life to Jesus, you have partaken in the good news. And man, I hope you are passionate about sharing that good news with other people about telling them about what God did in your life and that you want the same thing for them that you've already experienced. I pray that all of us would have a little bit of an evangelist inside of us that would come out. 
the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you don't know what that particular topic is all about, I want to refer to an old message series that maybe you could go back and watch on the app or on um, you know, the computer by going to journeychurch.org. We did a, a series, I think it was eight weeks long, where we discussed what is the gospel. We went into great detail about creation, the fall, the restoration of mankind, the rescue of Jesus Christ, about glorification, the things that are to come. So if that's a topic that interests you, you want to dig a little bit deeper on, I encourage you to go back in time and watch that message series. It really was a defining moment for us as a church, an oldie but a goodie that no doubt will still impact you today. So Mark 1, 2. As is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. So I talked about prophecy earlier. I bring you back to that at this particular point. As it is written, when you read about prophecies that come true, does that build your faith? Anybody in here? I know it does for me. As it is written, it came to pass. God's word could be trusted. It is true. Some people trust in Nostradamus. Guess what? He ain't accurate. You know what I'm saying? I mean, all true Bible prophecy comes true 100% of the time. And if you could trust in that, you could trust in the other things he says in the word about how we might live and how we might walk and what kind of power we might walk in as believers. There's prophecy coming true before our very eyes. That last sentence says, who will prepare your way? So it's speaking of this person who would come and he would have a particular message that would prepare the way. This person, as you're going to see in just a second, is none other than John the Baptist. He came not declaring, the British are coming, the British are coming. Like Paul Revere, he came declaring, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, repent, Jesus is coming. He was sent, and Bible prophesied in Isaiah that he would be coming before the Lord, and he certainly did in fulfillment of prophecy. Prepare the way. Verse 3, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So this is the message that he would preach. Obviously, it says from this particular verse that it would be a countercultural message as one crying out in the wilderness. Yes, he literally did go out into the wilderness, but what we know is that you and I, even in today's day and age, do you realize that we live in a spiritual wilderness? Do you see it all around you and everything that you witness? We live in a spiritual wasteland that is in need of a countercultural message. Do you agree? This dude was a little weird, as we're going to see in a few moments. He dressed kind of funny. He dressed kind of weird. But one of the challenges that I'm going to have for you today is it's time for us as Christians to get a little bit weird, to live just a little bit differently than the culture, maybe not just a little bit differently, a lot differently, that we would stand out actually like a bit of a sore thumb that everybody around you would know that person is a Jesus follower. In fact, we need to have the same message that John did. And I believe God wants to release an anointing and a spirit of John the Baptist on us. Because if Bible prophecy is true, the first time that Jesus came, he came to bring grace. He came to usher in the day and age of the church. He came to offer us salvation. He came to offer us forgiveness. Something that oftentimes in our own generation we take for granted, do we not? Even as Christians, we go on sinning. Do you remember what happened in the Old Testament? It would be like, poof, you're a pillar of salt. Poof, you're dead, right? So we take this grace at times and we say, okay, we can continue to go on living the way that we are because God hasn't judged us yet. We get these tattoos that say only God can judge me. Yes, he will judge you. He will judge you one day. He will. We can't go on sinning and think that nothing's wrong with that, right? The message that John the Baptist had was repent, turn from those things, live a different way, live countercultural. That's the weirdness in the space that God wants us to live in. Can I get an amen? So if you believe the word as I do, 
the Bible speaks of a day in the not too distant future where Jesus is coming back not to save, not to offer forgiveness, but to judge the world on sin and righteousness. If that be true, and we believe in the reality of heaven and hell, we believe in forgiveness and salvation, should our vigor and our response and our desire, knowing that this time he's not coming to bring grace, but this time he's coming to bring judgment, might it inspire us all the more to live and have the same message that John the Baptist did? I don't want to see my friends go to hell. You don't either, do you? Man, why do we concern ourselves with so many other things if we believe God's word to be true? How can we contain ourselves from sharing the good news, maybe even to the point of being annoying if we believe these things we're talking about to be true? Have you ever noticed that when people are passionate about something, they talk about it so much that sometimes it could be a little bit annoying? None of you have ever done that, have you? Let me give you a couple examples. So like today is the start of the NFL season. That's, that's a lot of fun, right? Our NFL teams are going to get out there. They're going to start going onto the field. They're going to be having a great time. And some of them are going to win and some of them are going to lose. But there's some football fans, could be even some of you guys. We're going to do some stereotypes today. Some of y'all go get dressed. I see a few people represent. They got their shirts on, but they look kind of normal. Thank you, Jesus, right? I mean, I know when you get out of here, you go paint your face and you be doing some crazy stuff and he's going to be tailgating out in his front yard and, you know, people do some, cra- they start dressing like birds and squawking and, and then I don't know how God brought me to a place that's so close to Gainesville because all you weird gator people be doing things like this and, and then all of a sudden, you all ain't Indians, all you FSU people, you start doing this kind of stuff. I mean, like, what's wrong with you people, Right? You get pretty weird for your NFL and college teams, do you not, right? Or how many, There's some other good stuff. I have a, 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 again, I'm talking stereotypes here. I have some great friends in each of these areas. But how many of y'all have ever met some of those annoying CrossFit people? Come on, Jesus. I mean, like, they, they, like, they get it down, and they're forging elite fitness. I know. You're stronger than I am. I know. You wear really weird socks. I know. I mean, like, you wear really weird socks. But the second they get in that genre, they start talking about it a lot. They're passionate about it because guess what? It's making real lives change, right? They've transformed their bodies. They've done something different that's amazing. And now they just want to tell me and make me feel bad because I'm old and fat and I can't do it anymore, right? I mean, like, they, you just, they, they get you. You know what I'm saying? Or the new one going around, there's always a different diet that's going around, and they're not, like like right now, it's like, I'm keto, baby, come on, Jesus, I'm keto, and I'm old, they used to call that the Atkins diet, you know, now it's the keto thing, and again, why are you trying to make me feel guilty, I want to eat my donuts back there, come on, you know, like, I get it, I've got issues, right? It's like that are people that are into politics. Almost every area of life, when you think about it, people get kind of crazy and rabid about it. And then I had a bit of a revelation as Mary Jo was talking to somebody on the phone while we were in the car the other day, and she was just like, I wish you were as passionate about Jesus than the stuff you're talking about right now. I'm like, ooh, come on now. Are you more passionate about Jesus than you are of the Jaguars? Are you more passionate about Jesus than you are about your workout regimen? Are you more passionate about Jesus than whatever that hobby is that you like so much? Guess what? There's nothing wrong about being passionate about those other things. Have fun. Enjoy it. Keep having fun. But even when you're in those contexts, are you the light of the world? Are you going out there and passionately telling people about this God who saved you and redeemed you? See, fitness will only last so long. When Jesus comes, all that's going to burn away, and their, hell's gonna, their, their life and their spirit is going to be either in heaven or hell for all eternity, right? All this stuff will pass away. Life and death, heaven and hell, salvation and bondage. God is real. May we be passionate about what we know, passionate about sharing Jesus as heaven and hell truly lay in the balance. Mark 1.4, what was John's message? John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. All and around the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. 
So John's effectively, before Jesus comes, still prophesying, still preaching the good news of the gospel. He's saying, God is the creator of all the world. He created you and me. He brought us and formed us out of dust. Then our first mom and dad, Adam and Eve, they sinned, and it put us in this spiral that's leading us nowhere. You all sense it, do you not? You could sense the weight of your sin in your own life. You could sense it on a corporate level as it weighs down the world. Well, God had this rescue plan, this Jesus who would come, and and John preaching this message would be like, and guess what? He's getting ready to come. He's right around the corner. His shoes, as we'll read in a moment, I'm not even fit to be able to untie. He says, We need to repent and turn to this king who we know has come but was coming for him. And then God will rescue us. He will begin to restore us. And one day soon he will make all things right and true once and for all time when he comes to judge the world on sin and righteousness. So he's going around preaching this message. And some hear it and they respond. And you see them getting baptized in the Jordan River. Man, maybe we need to start doing baptisms in the St. John's River. I mean, how amazing would that be with all the algae and people might not get out afterwards, right? No, but I I joke, but wow, what an amazing thing that is. So he says they're getting baptized. So this even predated Jesus with baptism. They did it back then. There was a Jewish form of baptism where you would die to your own sins. You would come out cleansed from it. So really it's the same thing. We know with the fulfillment of Jesus, you're dying to your old life as you go under the waters of baptism. You're coming out as a new creation, a newborn creature that's different than you were before. The old things have passed away. All things are new. If you haven't been baptized, I can't encourage you enough to do that when we offer it next, which I think is right around the corner at the end of October we're going to be doing that. So I want to encourage you to kind of follow in the footsteps of what we see there. In fact, this scene, as it continues on, Jesus himself actually gets baptized in obedience to God's word. It's an amazing thing. Read on when, we, uh, when you finish up afterwards uh, and do it at home as a, just a continuation of that. So... We have this message that we should be preaching that I believe is the same as John's in our own generation. Now, you might be fairly new to your faith or you might just not be comfortable sharing your faith at times. I want to refer back to yet one more message series. If you go on our app or online, you can find a message series called Follow Me that we did about a year ago leading into Easter where we really talked about how you could share your faith in your workplace, in your neighborhood, through your small groups, in your family. We talked about all these different contexts and not so scary ways in which you could go and begin to share your faith. So I want to encourage you to go back and read that and listen to it maybe as an added inspiration. Now, here's the part where I think we all get freaked out and why we don't want to follow John. Mark 1, 6. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Um, That's weird, guys. I mean, like, I don't know where you would go today to, like, get a camel hair suit. I mean, but that's, you know. And then think of some of the Christians that you see on TV with their purple hair and stuff. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're just, uh, they're a little too weird. You know, there's this measure where there's weird and then there's too weird afterwards. But he goes around and, you know, eating locusts. I I had, like, a giant, I was out by the pool. They were fixing up some stuff yesterday. And there was one of those giant grasshoppers, which I guess is locust-like. Dude, I'm I'm like a little girl when I see one. No, we stop. No, I ain't getting anywhere near that stuff. So I don't know how you even think about eating it. I would fail at fear factor the second they got to the eat the weird stuff part. I would just not survive when it gets beyond that. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you, you don't have to get that weird, so to speak, in an external sense. In our own day and age, I mean, some of the stuff that we do even as Christians and, you know, stylistically is just mind-blowing to me at times. You know, one of the big trends is every hip pastor has to have weird haircut and has to have skinny jeans on. Come on, Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all seen it, right? These are like the skinniest jeans that I have, and I'm telling you, I hate wearing them. I'm like complaining the whole time on the way into here today. I'm like, Lord, help me. I like those baggy ones. My wife said, you look like an old man when you wear that other stuff, right? So she, does, she doesn't allow me to wear that. And, and I don't have enough hair anymore for one of those cool haircuts. And you're like, if you're cool and hip, you're like, he's just old. He's bashing us because he can't have that kind of style, right? Come on. You know, I know what you're saying. But I don't think what God was really talking about so much as the external stuff of what they were wearing or uh, or that. I think what he's really talking about is 
that we need to be countercultural when it comes to the way in which we live. That us as believers, our lives shouldn't line up with the world. It says, do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be ye transformed by the washing of the word in your life, right? So our lives are to be weird. Our lives are to be countercultural. In a world where they're standing up for stuff that we know not to be true, our job isn't necessarily to go out there and point a bunch of fingers at them and say, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do this. Our job is to love them and talk about the grace of Jesus Christ and ask the Lord to convict them of their sins, right? To go out there and live counterculturally. I'd ask you a couple questions right from the get-go. Do your coworkers know that you're a follower of Jesus? Some of you are shaking your heads. Do they know? I mean, if something goes wrong, do they know that they could come to you and know you're that person that, they, that would pray for them and would be there with them? Do you live weird? Do you live different when you're in there? Do they see you opening up the Word of God on your phone or physically when you go to lunch? If they invite you to go out to the bar afterwards and hang out, do you say, maybe that's not the place I should be going because I know it could lead me to places where I shouldn't be, right? Or do you go with them? And again, I'm not telling you to avoid people who are far from God. I'm actually telling you the exact opposite. You need to live counterculturally in their midst so that they can see Jesus in you. You don't need to point fingers at them. You just need to love them. See, we got a text from somebody. We, we went to the Leonard Skinner concert, and uh, there was parts of that stuff before that were a little racy. There is no doubt. Like Kid Rock came on. I kind of like Kid Rock and some of the talent that he has, but that boy's got a foul mouth. Come on, Jesus. I mean, that boy, like, he, he did, right? And somebody was like, did you feel bad when you were there? Did you feel convicted of what you were doing, watching the things? It was so awful. I'm like, no. And they're like, what? What's wrong with you? I'm like, sending people um, that aren't followers of Jesus, I'm expecting them to do that. How would we expect them to do any different? What gets me mad is when believers do that kind of junk because that's what got Jesus mad, right? You never see him kind of calling out people that were far from God and telling them to do something. He generally approached them with love and grace and showed them a different way, and he would lovingly challenge them to repent, but he didn't go calling them out. The people that he called up and got frustrated with are the believers who continued to live in the ways of the world rather than the ways of the world. Does that make sense to you, right? So there's this call on our life to be just a little bit weird. But I do believe that we can balance ourselves in both our conduct and our appearance and live just a little bit differently, make a stand by the way that we believe, by the way that we act, by the way that we talk, and hopefully those around us will see just how different we are, right? Verse 7, and he preached and saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John does what all of us should do. He pointed people not to himself. He pointed people to Jesus. See, I'm not so concerned about taking selfies Unless one day Jesus is there, then I'll be like, yes, you know, because I want to point people towards Jesus. I want to point people towards him. This life is not about us, and John got that, and he gave everything for it, including his own head, if you read on a few more chapters, because he was passionate about the message that he was sharing, even up to the losing of his own life. God is looking for people like that in our generation, and I'm going to pray he would put that kind of anointing on you as you walk through the city of Jacksonville, that you would prepare the way for the Lord's second coming, because he is coming. Coming soon, and very soon we are going to see the king. See, I believe if you were to put a clock up there with all the prophecies that I've seen be fulfilled, I would not doubt if we're like at least at 1155. Might be 1159. We're that close. Lord, would you inspire us yet again about the things that really matter? Would we understand and cling close to the cross and our salvation? Would we remember how much he did for us and in turn do it for others? Mark 1, 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, this is after Jesus got baptized. 
He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. In the Old Testament, there are over 44 prophecies stating that Jesus would not return as Savior, but this time as judge of the world. I think our message is to be the same as that of John the Baptist. That we're to go out and tell the world, repent, for Jesus is coming soon. And I know that sounds a little bit scary. I know it it is a little bit countercultural, but it's exactly what our world needs today. It needs Jesus Christ, the one who came to save the world. And he said, put his spirit inside of you that you might be successful in doing that. You might say, but Eric, there's a lot of stuff jacked up in my life. Amen, you're in the right place. We're not here to call you out. We're here to pray that God would move on your heart. That if there's an area of your life that you need to repent in, that you would say, God, would you take this from me? Remember when I did steps one through three on the finances? It's the same thing. I'd say right now, is there an area of your life that you know is not in alignment with God's word? Do you know that he came to save and redeem you and help you in that area of your life? And Step three, would you surrender your life to him and watch what he does? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? We're going to sing one more song of worship in just a second. A great way to remember his goodness and his kindness and what he's done for you is to take communion. Today we're not going to do corporate communion, but I would encourage you. There's communion elements to both my left and my right. You're more than welcome when the altars get open to come on up here and take communion by yourself or with your family. If you need to pray, I'll be up here. Others will be up here. We would love to pray for you and with you. But I would ask you right now, have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus? If you haven't, right now is a great time to do just that. Are you a believer, but you're struggling in here today? Today's a great day to maybe say, God, from this day forward, I will serve you. I need your help. Would you flood me by the power of the Holy Spirit, just as John had promised? I believe he'll do that for you today. So if you're of either of those two groups, I'm not going to call you to the front today, but I would like to pray for you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up real high so I could see it? You need to dedicate or see your hand, ma'am. In your hand, hallelujah, and yours. Thank you, Lord. Father, we come together in prayer before we sing this last song of worship. Lord, I can't thank you enough for the message that John preached and that we're called to still preach in our generation. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Father, I thank you that someone was bold enough to preach that message to me in 1992 on that very day it changed my life it changed my eternity transformation began and lord may i never forget it i certainly don't regret it lord i pray for those who raised their hand or maybe didn't and wanted to i pray that this would be that moment in their life where they would say jesus you are the son of the living god who died on a cross and rose again that i might have life Thank you so much for coming in fulfillment of prophecy to prove that you are who you say you are. Thank you for the many changed lives, but most of all, thank you for changing me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me free. Lord, we just echo today that Jesus, from this moment forward, we will live our lives for you. And I ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit to instill a passion for evangelism in the hearts of the people of Journey Church. That we would be a people who's more than willing to get a little bit weird so that we might reach more people with your love. That that weirdness would be living counter to the culture that we live in today. So I ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to release the anointing of John the Baptist in all of our lives that we would live out our lives to prepare the way for your second coming. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Enjoy one more song of worship, then I'll close in prayer.
song could ever sing Worthy of every praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Come and lead us, Jesus. God, we want your heart and your mind. God, lead us in your love, God. God, we want to be like you, Jesus. We stand firm on you, God. And I 
Sing it out again. In holy, there is no one like you. There's no one like you, God. None beside you, Jesus. And show me who you are and feel me with your heart and lead me in your love to those. in your love, God. Lead us in your love, Lord. Come on, just tell them that right now. God, we ask you to lead us in your love, Jesus. Come on, ask him to lead us in your love, Jesus. Lead us in your love, oh God. Come on, sing this one more time. I will build. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust. Open up our eyes to see what you're doing, God. I want to be led by you. Come on, just ask him and tell him, God, I want to be led by you. Can you just say that out loud? God, I want to be led by you, Jesus. Lord, I want to be led by you, Father. In every moment, in every situation, God, may we be led by you, God. We want to be led by you, Jesus. One more time, I will build my life. And I will build my life. Your love, it is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I not be 
Put your hands together for our God today. Hey, small groups fairs today, I want to encourage you to not step out the door, but step back there into the annex, meet a group, allow God to work through that group to change you, to meet new friends, to grow in your relationship with Him. And then I want to encourage you as you go about your week this week, be just a little bit weird for Jesus. Have some people talking about you, talking about your faith. Go have a great week. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.